Uh, so, can you hear me? Can you hear me up there? Guys, there's no need to sit on the staircase. If, you, if there is a place in the middle, please stand up, move to the middle. Uh, in fact, we are not allowed to let people sit on the stairs except for the first lecture. So... Guys, move one. <laughs> There's a seat here. Okay, uh, there are a couple of seats here that I can see, at least one now. Uh, okay, so, so just uh, the class is still full. I know that several of you are asking questions about registration. How many of you are not registered? Okay, quite a few, which means that uh, quite a few people that are registered and are not here because the class as of this morning had 150 students. So please talk to them and ask them to drop the class if they're not planning to be here. Um, that's about what I can do now when the class is completely full. Uh, I'm assuming that people will drop it. We'll see when. Uh, as I said, we are going to have throughout the semester at least two discussion sessions every week. Throughout the semester, it's going to be identical discussion sessions that the TAs will give. The plan is to have one on Tuesday afternoon, 6.30, one on Wednesday afternoon, 5.30. Um, they will be at 3401 Walnut, the building above the Starbucks, fourth floor, as you go in with the, from the A-wing, turn left, you should see it there. Uh, who wants to, it's, it's not mandatory, but I highly recommend it. We are going to cover, we started yesterday, we're going to cover in next week also some Python preparation. And in the rest of the semester, we're just going to cover things that are being addressed in class. Uh, some preparation material as needed, and uh, stuff relevant to the problem sets. Uh, hopefully, all of you want to go. How many cannot make any of these? Oh, okay, not that many, sorry. Oh, a few more now. Okay, so we... One of them should be attended. If you can make one of these, you're good. How long are they? Uh, an hour. Uh, an hour and 15 minutes, actually. That's the plan. Just like a class. Uh, now, uh, if people absolutely cannot make any of these, uh, drop us an email, or, or better, uh, write it in Piazza. We want to collect uh, evidence, and we'll see if we need to add another session. Um, as I said, the first one was Python yesterday. We're going to continue doing Python, I think, in the next two meetings uh, next week. And then by that time, we're going to release the first problem set and we're going to discuss, start discussing uh, the problem set and relevant material. Um, okay, I think that's about it. Any questions? Yeah. Okay, Canvas. So don't worry about Canvas now until the problem set is out. 
Why do you want to see the canvas, please? <laughs> you, you got used to it. Yeah. So this class, everything is going to be open. The videos are also going to be open. Uh, the homework is going to be open, except for this, uh, uh, where things cannot be. Uh, but, but the homework itself, everyone can access it. So don't worry about Canvas yet. Uh, uh, there is a problem with those people of you that are not registered, but you don't have to worry because the problem set is going to be uh, open. Uh, I think the submission, the way we set up the submission for the first problem set, it's already after drop date and the final date of enrollment, so there shouldn't be a problem. Uh, okay. Any other questions? Yes. Couldn't hear you. Yes. Yeah. We're going to post it. The slides from yesterday are already on uh, from the Python session. Yes. They will be open. Yeah. Well, I'm working on it. It it will be okay. <laughs> uh, Everything takes a little bit of time because everyone is busy now. All the people that are working on it are busy with many other classes, but it will be open. At least they promised me it's doable, so we'll see. Uh, okay, so question about question. So every time, I know it's going to continue, but still I'm going to say, at the end of the class I get a few really good questions about the content of the class. Please ask it during class because it's a question that many other people are interested in. Uh, okay, so that's what we talked about last time. We, we kind of outline what are key issues in machine learning and today we're going to solve all of them. Uh, in particular, just to remind you, we, we talked a little bit about modeling, what it is, about representation. Specifically, we introduced this notion of a hypothesis space. Can you see this red point? Useful? Okay. So we talked about this notion of hypothesis space. We brought up the question of whether learning is at all possible. Uh, and as a corollary of it, we said, well, we must say something about what functions are we going to learn. Uh, and this is something that is going to go along with us all the time, an important concept. And then we, of course, said that eventually we'll need algorithms. And this is actually what I, I want to get to today, but we're going to go through all these three steps um, in detail. So this is the example we started last time. Uh, it's one example. The problem is context-sensitive spelling for what I call a confusion set, whether type 1, whether type 2. So. In real life, you're going to get a data set or a single sentence. It's going to have either the word weather type 1, red 1, or weather type 2, purple 1. And you'll be asked, or your model, you'll be asked which one is the appropriate one in the context of this sentence. That's the decision problem. In order to get there, you will get a data set with a lot of sentences that have whether type 1 or whether type 2, and they'll tell you that's correct or that's incorrect. And your goal is going to be to learn a function that in the future, on example that you've never seen before, will be able to determine which weather, which type of weather should be the right one in this context. So what we want to do is to make it a learning problem, and we basically said we're looking for a function that maps sentences or really more accurately, sentences that have weather type 1 or weather type 2 in them into the selection, the right type of weather. And we started by defining the domain of this function better. What are the access? What, are, what is the input? Because when you read the sentence, I have no idea what you see there. We need to concretely define what is the input that your algorithm is going to see. And we agreed on a representation. Many of you uh, made comments that maybe it's not the best representation, we are losing information, but it's a representation that we're going to use at least for the next few minutes. And this is the representation. 
we assume that we have an English dictionary that has 50,000 words. Say. That's the vocabulary that we have, 50,000 words. For each word in this dictionary, we define a Boolean variable that takes the value one if this word is in the sentence, takes the value zero otherwise. That's it. This way, I took each sentence and mapped it to a Boolean vector of, of dimensionality 50,000. Very few of these bits are going to be on, the length of the sentence number of bits. Most of them are going to be off, zero. And that's a representation of the sentence. Okay? That's a representation that your algorithm can read. Clearly, we, lo we lost some information. In this space, I'm going to take each sentence and color it as the weather type one sentence or the weather type two sentence. So I'm going to get two types of points, uh, purple points and red points. This is our modeling. Now, uh, what is the hypothesis space that we are playing with here? So what is, the what is a hypothesis space? It's the space of all functions that our learning algorithm can play with, can choose a function there, right? So what is the hypothesis space we're playing with now? Yes? Is it a bunch of matrices you can multiply the vector by? Uh, a bunch of matrices. I can multiply the vector by. This could be a hypothesis space, but I didn't define it yet so strictly, right? So at this point, it could be any function that can take a vector of dimensionality 50,000 and map it to 0, 1, any function. Maybe eventually it will be a smaller space of functions, but at this point, any function that takes a vector of dimensionality 50,000 and maps it to 0, 1 is in my hypothesis space, okay? Huge space of functions. That's the hypothesis space. I, I want you to get used to, to the terminology. Now, I want to ask a question about learning protocol, not because it's necessary for us to solve this specific problem, because it's important in learning in general. Uh, so the way I pose the problem is, I'm going to give you a sentence, comma, the correct type of weather. Okay? So that's supervised learning. I gave you as training data examples, X, <coughs> comma, Y, the label. How would you get this data, by the way? In real life, yes. Uh, you could just type weather on Google. Yes. Something like this. Probably you will not get enough sentences this way, but you could, yeah? Could you crowdsourcing with something like Mechanical Turk? Okay. You could actually get a lot of sentences using method number one and then ask people to annotate it and tell you which is the right kind of weather. That's going to be a lot of work. Another way... So you replace the Google part with looking at blogs and other online information, and you'll still do crowdsourcing to get the correct label. Okay, why do you say so? Yeah. So basically what you're saying, for this specific case, even though my learning algorithm is a supervised learning algorithm, right, I actually don't need to annotate data. What I can do is make an assumption. Assumption, the New York Times text is correctly spelled. 
I'm going to take all the sentences that have weather type 1 in them or weather type 2 in them. All sentences that have weather type 1 in them, I'm going to say these are positive examples for weather type 1 and negative examples for weather type 2 and vice versa. So with this assumption that what I encounter in the New York Times, say, is correct, then uh, I'm done. I don't need to work. I don't need to hire crowdsourcers. And this is a, really an important, very simple, but a very important thing because in real life, many times you will encounter cases that it's going to be very expensive to label data. This is the key problem in machine learning today, how to label data. And we need tons of label data. We have a lot of data. We don't have a lot of label data. But this is really the simplest but very useful example of how by making a simple assumption. Now, the New York Times does have context-sensitive sen spelling mistakes. Many books have context-sensitive spelling mistakes, but who cares? It's going to be a tiny, tiny fraction of them that are going to be mistakes, and the algorithm couldn't care less. Okay, so we're done with this. Now let's move. So, so we talked about the learning problem. This is the space we're playing with. It's a 50,000-dimensional space. Some points are red, some points are purple, and we want to find something that separates them. And this is where we ended last time. We said there are many, many ways to do it. Here is a good one. It separates the purple from the red perfectly. Here is not as good one, and another not as good one, and so on. But I think all of you agreed that uh, even though the green one, the first one, actually separates the data perfectly, it's not going to generalize well, because that's always possible to do. You give me a data set, whatever complexity it, ha it has, if it, it's consistent, that is, a single point is not labeled with two different labels, I can always separate it. But uh, then, if I get a new point, a new purple point, uh, who knows where it's going to be there and whether the green is going to do well on it or not. If you do something that is a little bit simpler, perhaps this one, uh, maybe there's a better chance that you'll do well in the future. And this is an intuition that we want to be able to uh, make a little bit more concrete later or substantiated later in the course, but for now, we're going to leave it as an intuition. It's really something about memorizing versus really learning uh, and impacts the, gener the, the ability to generalize. Our question is going to be how to find it, but before that, we want to uh, think a little bit more about how we do it. So because we don't like this green curve, uh, we have to decide, okay, so what are we learning? What do we want to learn? One possibility is to define the learning problem to be, I only want to learn linear functions that best separate the data. So not all functions. What do I mean by a linear function? By linear function, I mean a linear in the feature space. So if x is my data representation vector, this 50,000 dimensional Boolean vector, I'm going to define my classifier, my model, the function that I'm learning, as one weight vector w. Uh, my notation typically is going to be that w and x are column vectors. Uh, and then my function is going to be the dot product here between w transpose, so I took this w and made it a row, dot product with x, and I'm going to take the sign of it. By sign, I mean if it's positive, I'm going to say yes. If it's negative, I'm going to say no. So I'm spelling this out here. For those of you that are not fluent in the notation, this is what I mean by WTX. It's really the product of WI, XI, I ranges from 1 to N, where N is the dimensionality of the data. Basically, what does it mean? It means that I'm giving different weights to different dimensions in my feature space. Each one of the 50,000 words in my vector space is getting a weight, its importance, right? And then I multiply each feature value by its weight and sum it up. Uh, and as I said, sine of z is uh, either one if it's positive, zero if it's negative. So that's how I make the decision. 
Uh, now, so I restricted, my, now I can ask again, what is the hypothesis space? Now the hypothesis space is not all functions that map a vector of dimensionality 50,000 to 0, 1, but rather only linear functions. So my hypothesis space is really the space of these W's here. So W is what? Is a real valued vac function, a, a vector of dimensionality 50,000. Otherwise, I, <coughs> I cannot do this dot product, right? So basically, one vector of 50,000, this is my hypothesis space. Now, you could say, well, it's not expressive enough. And you would be right. It's not as expressive as the hypothesis space we had five minutes ago, but it's actually quite expressive. So many, many functions are linear functions. For example, I don't want to dwell on this a lot, but you will think about it also at home. If you want a conjunction, what is a conjunction? It's and. I want this word to be there, and this word to be there, and this word to be there. Choose these three words that you want. If I want to express this, it's a linear function. Why is this a linear function? So all my variables here in this, on these slides are Boolean variable, x1, x3, and x5. Can you read this? Uh, because I can't, so <laughs> it's good that you can. Uh, why do I say that this is a linear function? It's not written as a linear function. So basically, you suggested a W such that if, if I had a vector of x, my example, x1, x2, x3, x5, and so on, you suggested a W that will show that the dot product Wx behaves exactly like this conjunction. What is this conjunction? This conjunction says it's 1 if both if x1 and x3 and x5 are on, it's 0 otherwise. If you take W to be one, W1 is 1, W2 is 0, W3 is 1, W4 is 0, W5 is 1, and you compute this dot product, and then I added the threshold here, theta. So really what I said here is a little bit more general than the previous slide. Now my function is the dot product minus some constant number, fixed number, and I make this to be 3, now this function behaves exactly like this conjunction, which means that we show that this conjunction is a linear function. And you can do this for many, many other functions, just if you want to get the feeling that a lot of rules, the rules that we talked about a week ago when we started to talk about the Bedges problem, and many others are really linear functions. So linear functions are quite expressive. Here is one more example that you will do as homework. If I want the function at least m out of n, so let's assume that my rule for weather type 1 is um, take this set of 10 words. If you see at least three out of them next to weather, it's weather type 1. Okay, that's a reasonable rule, maybe. This is a linear function, and I'm writing it here, and you'll think about it a little bit at home and convince yourself that this is indeed a linear function. Uh, in fact, even probabilistic classifiers that we're going to address in the second half of the class are really linear classifiers. You can just, they don't, maybe you don't have to see that they are linear classifiers, but you can rewrite them and show that really they are linear classifiers. Of course, many functions are not linear classifiers. There is a huge space of functions that are not, yes? Sorry, can you explain why the first conjunction example is a linear function again? Okay, so, so this is a linear function at the top here. Right? It's a dot product between my example x and my weight vector t minus some fixed number because I want my vectors, I, I, I want to allow my vectors not to touch the origin. So, uh, do you understand this function? How this x1 and x3 and x5 behave? So, what I showed, what was given to us was a suggestion for how to define that? So we are working now in a five-dimensional space. Okay, n is five. Uh, and I'm taking this w. And I'm arguing that if you take this w, 
multiplied by your x, this is the function that you'll get, right? You'll get 1 times x1 plus 1 times x3 plus 1 times x5 minus 3. This function is going to be positive if and only if x1 and x3 and x5 are on. Otherwise, it's going to be negative. Okay, everyone agrees with that? Again, this function is going to be positive, that is, the sign of it is going to be 1, if x1 and x3 and x5 are going to be 1, otherwise it's going to be negative. And because of that, it behaves exactly like a conjunction. So what I showed is that a conjunction is a linear function. Okay? So now you will do yourself the exercise for this other function and convince yourself that that's also true. The only point I'm trying to make here is that when we say that something is linear, it's not something esoteric in some space up there. Rules that you have in mind are really linear functions. A lot of things that are collections of rules. Many things are really linear functions. And therefore, given that we're going to spend a lot of our time playing with linear functions, don't think about it as something very abstract. It's really something concrete, as concrete as I want this and this and this to be there. In fact, you can take a disjunction. I want either this or this or that to be there. Take it as an exercise and write it also as a linear function. Or here is a collection of things. I want at least seven of them to be present. Also a linear function. All these are reasonable things for us to express functions that will make decisions. Yes? So in this case, do we, is linear the same as like linear versus quadratic? So yes. Yes, yes. It's exactly the same thing. So linear means that none of the variables comes with uh, a power greater than one. Not linear. No. So, so what's inside here is linear. Yeah. Yes. What is W matrix of n to n? Say it again. What is W with n to n matrix? Is that allowed in Uh Let's not deal with it now. I don't know what to do with W that is a matrix because my x is a vector, right? And what I want to get as the output is a number. So if I start with a vector and I want to get a number at the end, I need to multiply it by a vector. Okay, so, so that's, that's the space I can play with. Okay, so, so many functions are linear. Basically, I want to take the fear out of this notion of linear functions, if some of you are afraid of it. It's basically a simple collection of functions, but many functions are also not linear. So again, I'm giving you a Boolean functions. If you're not used to this notation, this basically says x1 n x2 or not x1 n not x2. This is not a linear function. You can think a little bit about why is that. Um, and, and many other functions are not linear. Now, the important thing from the perspective of machine learning, really important thing, is that even though functions are not linear, because I want, for some reasons, to learn linear functions, say, functions can become linear. And let me give this example. So what I have here is the following problem. I want to distinguish between blue points and red points. So this is my training data. Think about it. Someone gave me blue points and red points, and I want to find a separator that will generalize. In the future, someone will give me a point on this x-axis and will ask me, is it blue or red? Right? That's, the, that's the learning problem. Again, x-axis is here. These are examples. Some are labeled red, some are labeled blue. Eventually, when they'll give me a point, if they'll put the point here, what do you want the label to be? My pr the prediction of my model. You want it red. If it's there, if it's here, 
Who knows, right? But, but that's, it's a learning problem, right? So now, clearly, with this learning problem, I cannot separate it with a linear classifier. What I can do is I can do this, for example. That's an expressive classifier. It separates it. And it says, by the way, that the point that I asked you about here was red. Now, what I'm claiming is that I can make this linear. And the way I'm going to do it is this way. So rather than plotting the points on the x-axis, without adding any additional information, I'm plotting them on the x, comma, x square axis, bringing quadratic terms into this for the question that you asked before. Now, notice that I, had, I, made, I did not add any information. I just changed the representation. Now, a linear function does it, separates blues from reds. Okay, really important. Um, really shows how important is representation in learning. It will determine, thinking like this, will determine what features we want to add. And, and we'll talk about methods to do this various ways, to increase the dimensionality of the problem. Think about this. Before I started with the problem of dimensionality one, each example was just one real valued number, I moved to dimensionality two. Right? And I can do this. This is a continuous space example. I can do this also in a discrete space example. Uh, let's skip this. So, so you could imagine that what you have is a function like this. Let's assume that the function that separates weather from weather is this Boolean function. Again, what, how do I read this? Uh, these are ors, just like before. I omitted the ends. I'm just using a product here. So this is x1 and x2 and x4, or x2 and x4 and x5, or x1 and x3 and x7. So think about the definition for weather type 1 to be, I want a preposition before weather, and I want the word condition after weather, or I want another preposition before weather, and I want the word tomorrow after it. Something like that, right? So this is a function like this. Uh, and it's clearly a nonlinear function. I can make it linear by inventing new features. Just like before, I move from x to x comma x square. Here I'm going to invent each conjunction here as a new feature. Uh, so let's assume each conjunction of three things is going to become a new feature. This will increase my dimensionality. Let's assume that I have n features in my original space, and I take each triple, conjunction of each triple, and make it a new feature. How many features will I have now? Yeah? n choose three. So each combination of three things, I'm going to make a new feature. I'm going to have now a lot more features. It's like n cubed or something like this. But now uh, I have this new space, this y space, where all combination of three things are individual features. And instead of having a curve like this, I'm going to have a linear thing. I'm trying to draw here a hyperplane in a high dimensional space. Uh, and it's linear. So we can do this. Now, uh, what I want to do now is I want to give you a concrete example of how we actually do these things in learning. So when you go to the slide, you can click on this real weather weather example, uh, and you will get to a website that has weather weather examples and a few other examples of context sensitive spelling. I have problems showing this here. So what I did is I did some screenshots. Um, oh, before I get to the screenshot, just a second. Uh, why is this important? Remember that we talked about the spam filtering example last time. This is slide 23 that we talked about last time. And I suggested as one feature, I don't know if you can read it. Does the email contain the word money? And then that was a legitimate feature that might help us to distinguish between yes, spam, no spam. And then we asked, then we talked about uh, the, the feature, does the email contain the word money and the word send? 
And we talked about whether it's enough for us to just say contain the word money and separately contain the word send. Or it makes a difference if we say in one feature contains the word money and send. And we agreed, I hope, that information-wise makes no difference. You can tell your algorithm that it contains both, whether you say it independently or whether you say it together. Hopefully now you understand there, there could be some difference because the expressivity of the hypothesis space, the function space that you will use, could depend on it. There are some functions that you will not be able to express if all you give it is the individual features and not their conjunctions. And we're going to see this more. So, so I want to show you a real example now. So what I show you here uh, is three steps of representation. The first step is features. I want to generate features for the weather weather example. So we, before I suggested a very poor representation of, you know, just take every word in the document and call it uh, define a Boolean variable. Really, in order to do well on this problem, I need to have more types, more interesting types of features. So I'm suggesting here four types of features. One and two, uh, I'm going to take into account the relative position of a word relative to my target. So I'm going to look at a sentence that has the word weather, and I'm going to look to the left and to the right, small window, and I'm going to look at which word is there and which power speech tag is there. The power speech tag is not written in the sentence. Magically, I have a box that knows how to compute it. So just believe that. Uh, so that's feature one and two, right? I'm looking either at the word plus one to the right of it or minus one to the left of the target word, and I'm recording either the W, the word itself, or its power of speech tag. Okay? Feature type two, or three, actually, these are two types of features, is the conjunction of these. I'm looking at two things. Either word to the left and word to the right, or word to the left and power of speech to the right, or word to the, or power of speech to the left and word to the right, and so on. There are four combinations. I'm looking at these conjunctions. And type four is just look at a window around the world and record which word appears there. Now, four types of features. Everyone understand what, what are the types of features? Now realize that these four types of features are going to generate a huge number of features. The important distinction I'm making here is between types of features, four <coughs> types, and the number of features that are going to result and that my learning algorithm is going to see. Because now I'm going to give these four types of features data and they're going to see many Ws and many POS tags and they're going to ger generate many features as a function of it. So what you see here are features that are generated. So the top one says 1P, which means the power of speech tag at position 1 to the right is a determiner. The next one is 1W, which means the word to the right is the word the. Minus 1P, the power of speech tag to the left is punctuation mark. Uh, and here I have a conjunctive feature. The minus 1P is verb, V, and 1P is adverb. So, so this is the list of all features that were actually generated by taking these four types and showing them data. For example, you can see here uh, you. Uh, the word you, that, that comes from this feature type. Number three here, th this word appeared somewhere in a small window around the target. Okay, so what I showed you here is feature types and then all the features that are the result of instantiating these feature types with the data. So different data is going to give me different features, but the same types of features. Is that clear? And then uh, on the right, I also put some statistics that do not matter at all. 
It's just for the analyst of someone that wants to see. So basically what I show here, the last the two numbers to the right are how many times each feature occurred with weather type 1 and weather type 2. And there's also some statistics here that I used to sort these, which is really a chi-square statistics. It doesn't really matter for us now. Questions? Yeah. Yeah, it's here. This is the list, right? So all the features that will say minus W, minus 1 W <coughs> equal that. That would be a match, right? Yeah. So, so again, so the important thing here, th this is really what, what, what your programs are going to do, right? So you decide what are the feature types. You're not going to decide, I want if the word W, if the word to the right of my target word is D, say yes. If the word to the right of me is table, say yes. If the word is desk, say yes. What you'll do is you'll define types of features and let it loose on your data. So that's part one. What is the result? How do I use this? OK, so that's a little bit too small. So, Really, the way I'm going to use it, let, let me do this. Um, up. Oh, you cannot see this now. Ah, oh, come on. Okay, forget it. Just, what is happening here? Okay, so let's, let's try to see nevertheless. So, so what I have here are sentences. This is my data set. And I took sentences, and whenever I saw either weather or weather, I put brackets around it to indicate this is my target word. And this is telling my script that took these four types of features, look around this guy. So each sentence here comes with either one or multiple weathers. And of course, you will see that most of my examples are this kind of weather, not the focus type of weather, because statistically, this kind of weather appears in text a lot more. There's nothing we can do. If you go over all this data, you'll see a few examples of all, also of the other type of weather. So what, what am I doing here? I'm basically giving you data. I gave you the four types. And now you are instantiating the four types with this data to generate the real features. This is how we generated this, this uh, table from before. Now, this table isn't enough. This is just the index of the features. What I need is I need examples. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a name to each one of these features. Let's say I'm going to number them. OK? I'm going to number them uh, from 2 to whatever I have. I'm reserving 0 and 1 for my labels. And then what I'm going to get is I'm going to get these vectors. So each row here is an example that my learning algorithm is going to see. So the first entry in each example is the label. You will see that the first entry is always 1 or 0. Most of the examples are weather WH, which are 1. Some of them are zeros, which are the focus type of weather, and they are zeros. And after that, you see the features. Now, let's assume that I have 100,000 features here. Among the 100,000 features that I put into this table here on the right, only a few are going to be active in a given example, right? Uh, very few relative to the 100,000. I don't want to carry a big vector uh, with many zeros and a few ones. Instead, I'm representing it as a sparse representation vector. I'm just writing the, the indices of those features that are on in my vector. That's why you see here variable size, uh, 
Well, th that's why you see these lists rather than zero ones. Okay? And I gave you the answer to this Y. I, I want a, a sparse representation because it's going to take a lot more space if I don't use a sparse representation. Everyone is okay with this? Uh, and also, you can see that it's variable size. Why is it variable size? Yeah? Because it's sparse, so you're not seeing all the data. If it was, if it was the full vector, they would all be the same. No, no, but I see all the features, right? So, so if, if I sit around the world, I see what's on the left, I see what's on the right. Why, why is it not the same number, yes? Because the word whether type 1 or type 2 appears in different locations in each sentence. So it could be like either the last word in the sentence or the first word, which would result in having less. So that's one factor. If it appears, say, as the first word in the sentence, then I don't have features on the left. So I have less active features. That's one reason. Yes? W what do you mean? That's true, but it's not the reason for variable size. What will I do if a word appears multiple times? Yes? Yeah, so I, I will generate multiple examples. So an example here does not correspond to a sentence. It corresponds to an occurrence of my target word. So that's a good point, but doesn't address this. So I'll give you a hint. The data here is the test data, not the training data. And uh, the fact that it's a test data magnifies the fact that the vectors are a variable size. Why? Yeah. Because we created the features. The features we created are dependent on the training set. Exactly. So, so let's assume in the training set I had 50,000 words and I've generated this lexicon based on it. Now come the test data. And I see the word weather and next to it I see condition. I've never seen the word condition in my training data. So I want to generate the feature 1w equal condition, but this feature does not have an index because it wasn't observed in the training. No feature here. So, so the fact that you see such a difference in length between examples is an indication in a sense to the difference between the vocabulary observed in the training and the test plus the issue of beginning and end and, and, and so on. Yes? Uh, in the training set, it could be that one occurrence of weather matches to several features, right? Because it could have like a word before it, the, maybe you have like a word after you, you know, or, or like a punctuation mark after. So there could be several features that match mm -hmm. an occurrence of weather in the training set. Or am I mistaken about that? For sure. No, no, so, so let's take an example here. Of course, every occurrence of weather, let's take this guy here. Can you read it? So this word weather has is before it, has all capitalized after it. So this is going to give rise to uh, the feature minus 1w equal is, plus 1w equal all, minus 1p equal verb, plus 1p equal whatever power of speech this one has, uh, and then the conjunction of all these. So each occurrence of a word, if it's in the training, and if it's in the middle, doesn't have this kind of a boundary condition, is going to give rise to 16 features or something like this. You can kind of... No, no, but in training, module boundary condition, all of them are going to be there. Every weather is going to generate 16 features. Okay? So, so you'll have a list of size 16. Different if it's at the beginning of the sentence or the end. But basically in the training, all of them are going to generate. Now, 
And this is going to give me the lexicon, the union of all these, all occurrences of weather type 1 and type 2 is going to give me my lexicon. Now I'm taking this lexicon, go to test. I see some new things that are not in my lexicon. What can I do? I could, in principle, even have an empty example in the test. Because the context, now, now the context that you have in mind is different than the context my algorithm has in mind. Because my algorithm doesn't know what context is. All it knows is look at plus one, minus one, that's it. That's the context. And I know W and I know P, part of speech tech, that's it. So even though you say, well, you saw, you saw table before and now you see desk before it, same thing. It's not the same thing for my algorithm, right? I have a fixed lexicon based on the vocabulary I've seen, done. Yes. Yes, right. that's what I'm going to pass to my algorithm. So the model has to be able to, to use vectors of size 0 to 16. Okay, so, so this is already an implementation thing. So this is, you could represent this as a vector of size, whatever, 100,000, with most zeros and some ones, and give this to the learning algorithm. Some implementation of learning algorithms, as you will see next week already, uh, when you start working on the problem set, only know how to take fixed size vectors. So you'll have to give it that, this way. If you write your own implementation, you may want to deal, write it such that it deals with variable size. So you'll give it just this representation. But this is, uh, these are kind of subtle uh, but simple implementation issues, right? But the bottom line is that the algorithm is going to get a vector that represents, uh, that lists the features that are active. Uh, and this feature represent the context at some level. Not the real context, what you decided to let your algorithm know about the context. These are the four types. This is what you decided to reveal to your algorithm. And that's really an important thing to know. So my algorithm now knows nothing about whether weather beyond these four types of things that I told it. Okay? Okay, so, so that's representation. We are done with representation. Uh, you're going to play with it a little bit more, but I, I really wanted to give you an idea of what's, uh, how does it look, really. Um, now we want to learn. So we talked about modeling. We chose a hypothesis space. We talked about representation. We really made it concrete, and now we want to learn. So, so how do we learn? So, so I have these examples. I decided to learn a linear function, a weight vector, w. This is w. How do I do it? So we, we want to search a, for an algorithm now. Uh, suggestions. How do I find this, this w that will split the reds from the purples? Yeah. In one way, you could like just start with a like horizontal line or some like dumb first start, and then given like the points one at a time and their labels, you could like adjust it based on you know minimizing the error among those points, kind of like a linear. Excellent. So I'm going to start somewhere. You know, I'm going to choose a random W, and I'm going to show it data and ask, what do you think about this data? And it's going to make predictions, and whether the, depending on whether the predictions are good or not, I'm going to change it. So all I need to do now, given this excellent suggestion, is to decide how do I know what's good uh, and how to change and how to correct once I decide it's not good enough. So this is really what I call here a local search algorithm. I'm starting with something. I, dis I see how well I'm doing. If I'm lucky and I make no mistakes, I'm happy. Uh, correct, and then repeat until I converge to something. So that's a conceptual algorithm. Now, um, just as a side, this is the algorithm we're going to develop today, uh, but as a side comment, it's not the only way. There are other ways to learn linear functions like this that are 
what I call one shot in a sense. So I'm showing it the data, it computes something on the data, boom, it has a W. It doesn't need to iterate and try things and correct if it makes mistakes and so on. But now we're going to deal with this and, and first we have to think about how to think about how well we're doing. And this will allow us to, to really give a general framework for everything we're going to do in this class. Uh, the goal is to predict an unobserved output value Y based on the observed value X, the example. Uh, so, which means that we really want to estimate this functional relation, Y F of, is, is a function of X, from this set of examples, uh, X, Y, uh, my R training set. So, uh, really we're going to talk most of the time about classification. So the Y is going to be 0, 1, or some other discrete set. But for the same price, we could have talked about regression, where Y is real valued numbers. So, we want to talk about what do we want Y to satisfy. And we're going to introduce some notation. So, really what we want is we want Y to be good, which means minimize something that we call risk. What is this risk? Is the expectation over the space X, Y, X are examples, Y are labels, of this thing, of it's a characteristic function that what I mean by F of X different than Y is this is one if F of X is not Y, and this is zero if X of, F of X is Y, right? It's a characteristic function. So essentially what I'm saying here, forget expectation if you're not used to this term, is count how many times f of x is equal to y, divide by the number of examples, right? So the average number of cases where f of x is y, that's a, a, an expression that represents how well I'm doing, right? Uh, so, uh, so this is really something that I want to minimize. Ideally, I want that f of x will be equal to y every time. So uh, I want to minimize the risk. Uh, and sometimes we're going to call it loss, even though the, there is a little bit of distinction. But I'm sure that I'm going to use these terms interchangeably. So that's what we want to we wanna minimize. Now, as a side note, that might mean nothing to many of you now. It will mean a lot to you uh, as we get to the second half of the class. I just want to say that if we know the distribution over x cross y, x are examples, are sentences, say, in the weather weather case, y, the labels, if we know the exact distribution, there's no learning here, right? We can just look at this distribution and compute the most likely y for each x. <coughs> Uninteresting. So we don't know this distribution. Uh, the problem is that we want to estimate y from x or f of x from y and we want to minimize this guy. Now we cannot minimize it because we don't know the distribution. We don't know, we know just a small number of examples but there's a huge number of examples out there that we have no idea how they behave, what kind of y's they like, whether most of them are weather type 1, most of them are weather type 2, What's the relation between the vocabulary and the weather type and so on? So, what do we do? We, we agree to just focus on the training data and say, you know what? I cannot minimize it over all the distribution because most of it I'll never see. I'm going to minimize it on my training data. And we call this the empirical, the empirical error, right? So basically, instead of doing this, where I count how many times f of x is different than y on the whole distribution, which we cannot do, I'm going to count how many times f of x is different than y on my m examples, my m training examples. And, and I'm going to try to do well on my training data and hope that doing well on the training data is going to mean that I'm going to do well also on examples that I've never seen before. No guarantee at this point. Eventually, we want to be able to get some confidence that if you're going to do well on the training data, under some conditions, you're going to do also well on examples that you've never seen before. But a priori, you can see that there's no guarantee. 
if you want to get develop intuition, think about the Boolean simple examples that we've seen last time with the seven examples where several of you gave functions that are different. So it's always could be the case that I'm doing okay on the training, but I have disagreements on the test. Yes? Are you including like test data as part of the training data? I, I, I don't have this notion now. I see a bunch of data that is labeled. That's what I'm doing. Whether you have more data that is, uh, that is labeled, I don't care about now. Either way, uh, in any realistic set, uh, in any realistic data, uh, the amount of data that you will have to play with that is labeled relative to the huge space of possible data is going to be tiny. If you're not sure about it, think about the dimensionality of the problems we were talking about, right? Even if you just have a hundred dimension, Boolean, not real valued even, Boolean, it means that you have two to the hundred different examples. So X size is two to the hundred. Okay? Huge. You will never see it, of course. You'll see a tiny fraction of it. So uh, it doesn't matter whether I see, you know, uh, also a little bit of train, uh, test data. So, so the issue is that I'm going to try to minimize my empirical error. Uh, and another complexity, in addition to the fact that the problem that we don't have data available, just a little bit of it, is that this computational problem is hard. If I want to minimize, so, so let's look at this picture here. Where was it? This. I have, positive ex I have purple examples and red examples. If I want uh, to find a line that minimizes the number of purples that goes to the red side plus the number of red examples that go to the purple side, again, if I want to find a line that minimizes the number of purples that are on the red side plus the number of reds that are on the purple side, it's a hard computational problem. Those of you that know what NP-complete is have some uh, better understanding of what it means, but computationally it's hard, which means that all algorithms we know how to compute are going to be exponential in the size of the data. We don't want that. So, so that's the second uh, difficulty. Inst therefore, rather than really minimizing the number of mistakes that is written here, or the average number of mistakes, same thing, we are going to cheat a little bit. We're going to minimize something else, something that is easier to minimize. Uh, we're going to call this uh, a surrogate loss function rather than the real loss function. Uh, and we're going to invent another function. Typically, this other function is going to be a convex function that will do, be an upper bound of the real uh, classification error that we care about. Uh, we can invent many loss functions that have these properties. Uh, for example, uh, so, so again, the function that we really want is this misclassification error. It's something that is zero if we got it, and it's one otherwise, right? We want to minimize this. Uh, instead, for example, I can go for the square loss. Uh, so I'm going to measure my loss as f of x minus y squared. Okay, I'm going to average this over all x's. So you can see that this is related to the loss, but it's not exactly the same. It looks like this. As, as y and f of x uh, go apart, are different, then this loss goes up. But it's not just discrete 0 and 1, it just grows. And you can invent many, many other loss functions, and we'll see some of them. For example, you can say uh, that um, you have a function that is 0 if you got it right, and c of x, some function of x, if you didn't get it right. Uh, in general, it's going to look like this. You're going to have a graph where it's centered, it's 0 where you get it right, because of the, cho the selection of the x-axis here, or the z-axis here, uh, it's on 1. But this is, when you get it right, it's 0. And when you get it wrong, it goes up. So the black curve here is my 
zero one loss. This is what I really want. I want to get no penalty when I get it right, and I want to get a fixed penalty of size one, say, when I get it wrong. Uh, all the other functions are other loss functions. I'm not going to get into the details of them now. We're going to see them later in the class. But for example, the green one is the quadratic loss function. It grows symmetrically around the minimum as f of x and y go apart. So that's what I want to minimize. Uh, so that's the principle. Yes? Why is the classification that you make in this case? The why? why is the classification? So then if you're squaring it and it's either a difference of 1 or 0, how is that still not? <clears throat> so, so why is the label the truth? f of x is the function that my learning algorithm produces. Uh, some learning algorithm will produce 0 and 1. So in this case, you're right. I mean, if I say 0, y is 1, the difference is 1. If I say 1 and y is 1, the difference is 0. There are only two options. In most cases, my f of x really is going to be a real value. Uh, and then I'm going to compare it to the, to the y, to the 0 or 1. Or later on, I'm going to make 1 to be plus or minus 1 rather than 0 and 1. And then I'm going to have more values in the difference between f of x and y. But yeah, that, that's important to, to understand. Yes? So it's just a little bit confusing what we're trying to minimize. What we're trying to minimize what y is? No, no. So, so here is what we're trying to minimize. We're trying to minimize really this, right? So it's, I'm looking at all my examples, and I'm looking at whether f of x, which is the prediction of my algorithm, is equal to the label y or not. And I'm counting how many times it's equal, how many times it's not, and I want to minimize the number of times it's not. That's what I want to minimize. Instead, because I don't know how to minimize this, I'm going to invent another function, which is going to be this. f of x minus y squared. This, this will replace the f of x equal or not equal to y. So I'm going to replace this guy by this, and I'm going to average this over all my data and want to minimize that. So you see that if it's 0, it means that f of x was equal to y for all data. If it's not 0, there are many ways how it's not 0. It could be one example where it's very far and the rest are close, or it could be many examples where it's, it's not exactly y but low values. Yes? It's not linear. It's quadratic, you see? Yeah, but you can solve it with squares. That's what we're going to do. Yeah. But the other one can be solved too, right? Because the only nonlinearity is like that sum in the end, but it can produce that sum for every, like, uh, You're asking why working with respect to this black curve here, yeah, why the step function, yeah. why is this hard? Uh, I can give you a pointer to, to, prob, to, to why. It's not a trivial argument, but it's, it's hard. It's, it's, you have a lot of options to consider, uh, while here it's a continuous function, so I can compute uh, derivatives. Yes? Do you ever assume like, noise in the test data? So like, if you're going through like, a scraper and they use the wrong weather every once in a while, you're putting like, an error term? So, so at this point, no. Eventually, yes. So, so most algorithms, as you will see, uh, don't really care about it. The reason I want to add some error terms uh, is going to be not so much for dealing with noise, but more with dealing with uh, expressivity of the function class to avoid overfitting. But let's forget about noise now. So, so let's assume that all my data is clean. Even when it's clean, think about it. All I see is a hundred examples or a thousand examples, and I, I never see most of the examples that I'll see in the future when I'm training. So there's really no reason to believe uh, a priori that if I'm doing very well on my empirical data, on my training data, 
I will also do well on in the future. We'll have to develop an argument for that, even when there's no noise at all. Um, okay, so, so now we can develop an algorithm, which unfortunately I'm not gonna do now. Uh, we're gonna all, only do it on Tuesday. This is gonna be the type of algorithm that we're gonna use, right? So uh, it's gonna be a local search algorithm, and the, the key thing now, once we have agreed what to do, and we agreed to use this uh, LMS function, right? So uh, list means square, which means this function is gonna be our, uh, where is it? Okay, uh, it's, it's gonna be two more slides together. Uh, we, we agreed to measure our error as f of x minus y square, average over all the data. We have to develop an algorithm that knows how to do the correction. So we chose a random w, we look at what is the error we have, and we want to change w such that next time the error is going to be lower. That's the only step left for us. And we're going, in order to do it, we're going to do a uh, gradient descent algorithm. So if you guys don't remember what is a gradient, you have the weekend, refresh your memory with what a gradient is, because we're going to use it next time. Uh, final questions? Yeah? No outliers, the data is perfect. So, so I think it's the same question that worried someone here before. What if the data is, is noisy? So, so let's assume now that the data is not noisy. As we will see, it will not matter at all. Your learning algorithm is gonna be robust enough so that if a few examples here and there, so some of the weathers that are type one will have label type two, the algorithm wouldn't care it will learn essentially the same function even in the presence of this noise. It's surprisingly robust. This is not gonna uh, really hurt us too much. Other questions? Okay, have a good weekend. See you Tuesday.
you, uh, you said that the conjunction of two features is linear, right? No, no. Oh, I thought, okay. No, no, no. Very good question. No, I didn't. Okay. This is the trick, is it's a linear function. But really, in terms of my original features, the target function is not linear. What would I do? What I'm going to do is I'm going to generate more expressive features. You said that like x1 or x3 or x5, that that can be expressed, or x1 and x3 and x5 can be expressed. That can be expressed as a linear function. Okay. But, but when I do that, uh, what I do is I, I replace features. So the example that I gave. Um, sure, with the, the. This one or the second one, which is more discreet. Mm -hmm. yeah x1 and x2 and x5, or... Okay. So this was is not a linear function. Okay. Right? H how, how can you tell which is or which isn't? Or is that uh, just something that I... It's, it's like kind of like a so. Okay. I mean, it was a so. Mm -hmm. so. So this, it's a DNA. So it, it's kind of like a so. Okay. It's not linear over the xi space. Okay. But, so what I do is I change the, the space and now I make it x1 and x2 and x5 are going to be a new feature. The other two mm -hmm. are going to be a new feature and so on. And what I'm left with yeah. over the new feature space with a disjunction, um, this like is the DNA. Okay, I think I understand. So, so go over this slide again and, and think about it. So, so definitely what I did is I, I changed the space mm -hmm. to make the new function linear in the new space. Okay. Yeah, I was just confused about well, when a conjunction talk about is this linear. Professor, uh, okay. when you concept. meant conjunction for that words, what do you mean by that? I conjunction is and. And, and yeah, 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 but okay. Conjunction of size two oh. that means combination of two words. But the words are not boolean, right? If you have oh, in, in my example yes. of the features, yes, every feature is boolean. It's it's whether the word after whether is D, ah. yes or no, it's Boolean. Okay. It's, it's what? It's Boolean, right? So I'm, I'm asking, when I, when I wrote one W equal that, in that's the example, yes. that's a Boolean uh, variable. It's one if it is, zero if it's not. So everything is Boolean. That's a very good question again. You, you should have asked me. I didn't really understand exactly. Can we yeah, Boolean can we can So feature is hand. true or false. Yes. The examples that I gave here, answer. the features are true or false. And then the feature Boolean. types are the things that just style of the schema. The feature so type for is example, if you have that, uh, a collection. A feature type is a function yeah, is that, that actually decides what no, am I seeing in the data. Right, so you give me a sentence. Okay. You see a lot of things in the sentence. You have to tell the algorithm what's in the sentence. How do you tell it? You say, okay, let's look only around the target world, one to the left, one to the right, and record which world appears there and which part of speech appears there. That's what it says. So these are the feature types. Feature type is the words that are defined. No, no, feature type is what to look at in the input. Okay. Now you take this, you, you can implement multiple feature types depending on the problem, but Feature types decides what we are seeing in the input. In my case here, I had four feature types. <laughs> One feature type was look at the world that is just before, yeah. look at the world that is just after. Or speech, or first speech yeah. Let's assume this, that is it. Now, you decided on the type, now here is data. Data comes in, I'm looking at the world before and I see it's D. Mm -hmm. So I'm writing, okay, world before equal D. Okay. It's this is something that either holds or doesn't. Mm -hmm. In this sentence, it holds. Mm -hmm. In another sentence, it may not hold, and so on. So I'm, I'm writing everything that I've seen that satisfies these feature, feature types, and I generated this huge index that I showed in representation one slide. Mm -hmm. That's my index. These are all Boolean features. Either they are present in a given sentence, or they are absent from a given sentence. So then when we're reading additional data that we're given that we haven't seen before, you, you if we see a feature uh, that like matches up with a feature we've seen before, like the, the word before we've seen, we've seen like the... You have to have a very big table to... Yeah, you have 
table. Yes. So I generated this, this big table in representation one. And when you give me a new sentence, I'm checking which one of these is active in this sentence, which one is not. And I'm recording this, and this is my representation of the new sentence. And that's it. That, that's my representation. That's what my algorithm sees. The sentence translates to the number of features that are active. Exactly. So the numbers that were, that slide that had a lot of numbers Lots, and stuff? This is the representation of the sentence in the language of the lexicon. And then, uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, my question is, uh, how do we distinguish what's, what's that is the modeling, what's that is the representation, and what's the step of algorithm? Yes, I think like how we choose to represent the data is kind of the part of the modeling as well. Yes, it, it, it's, all, it's all related also because once you know which algorithm you want to use, you may choose representation based on it and yeah. vice versa. Yes, so, so they are not independent steps. Okay, I see. But, but they are distinct steps, but they are not independent. I may decide which hypothesis space. Of course, the algorithm will be dictated by, partly at least, dictated by which hypothesis space I'm going to use. Yes. And the representation will this also be related is, to which yeah. algorithm. So, so they are not independent is, steps. Oh, yeah, I see. Because I see the, in the lecture, it's like, like uh, Yeah, I, I wanted to deductively uh, yeah, to, yeah. to kind of explain yeah. what I'm doing now. Yeah. Okay. But because it's, it's the first time you're seeing it, so hopefully it will help. Maybe it will confuse. Yeah, so it's not like a linear step, like what you're no, no, you, you probably think about it a little bit more holistically. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Hi. Hi. So I'm not enrolled in the course yet, but I need, a, it will be my last tech elective before I graduate, so I'm curious. So you are now a senior. Senior, and you're on the way to me. Yeah. And I either and, need and, to and get in here in or... CIS? Uh, NEPS, yeah. Okay, so you, you're in principle a high priority uh, person on the list. <laughs> Today, the course is completely full. Right. I have no question that people will drop the classes. Yeah. Um, so you just have to be patient. Okay, <laughs> certainly. Just wanted yeah. to make sure I at yeah. least mentioned it to you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, I actually have one more question. Sure. So, uh, now I understand what the numbers in that PowerPoint slide, that's the number of features that were active in a given sentence. Um, and then after that, we, we did, we, we graphed, we, we plotted points, and we said we want to make a line such that it divides the yes. two points. Into, what were those points? I don't understand. So the points were these vectors. So each vector is really a point in the 50,000 dimensional space. Okay. It's a Boolean vector, so it's zeros and ones. Yeah. I represented it in this variable size, uh, just to show you that there are two ways to represent a vector. You can just write a vector of zeros and ones, or you can give me a list of all the places where there is one, right? So when you put it on this figure as purple points and red points, you think about it as zeros and ones in a 50,000 dimensional space, and it defines the points. When I write my programs this, I don't know if you want to write it this way, I will not represent it this way, but rather I, it's, it's, it's going to take a lot of space, I will represent it as the list of all ones. So this is the variable size uh, list that I showed you. And, and someone asked and I said, this is just an implementation issue. These two representations are equivalent. Yeah. And you, you decide how you want to do it. Okay, and the, and the purple dots were separated from the red dots? or one of Yes, yes. Because the red ones are the ones that are Yes, two colors. So the purple was weather type one, the forecast weather, yeah. and the red were the, the WH weather. The test data. The, I mean, no, sorry, no, this that is was the date. Yeah, this was the training data. Training data. Yeah. So the training data came uh, with a label, right? Each example, each sentence, each occurrence of weather, I knew whether it's weather type one or weather type two, sure. so I colored it. Sure. Okay, does, but uh, why is that relevant to what we did before with the features? Uh, so, so you gave me a sentence with the word weather, okay. one of them. Yes. 
I want to place it in this vector space. Sure. How do I place it in the vector space? I have to define dimensions for this vector space. The features are the dimension of the vector space. Right? Dimension one is is one w equal that. Dimension two is one w equal table. Dimension three is one p equal determinant, and so on. These are the fifty thousand dimensions. Is let's that, let's say 50,000. No, no, but, but overall, once you see a lot of words, there are going to be a lot of these things. But I don't see, there's four questions. Yeah, but the four questions are, there is a word after weather. But what is the word after weather? Once you read it, New York Times, uh, many there's documents in the New York yeah. Times, yeah. you're going to see a lot of words that occur yeah. after weather. Each one of them is going to be a feature, okay. and each one is going to be a dimension in this feature space. Okay, okay. okay so you'll have a lot of dimensions, uh, and, and the, therefore, and this is the size of the lexicon. The table, the elongated table that I showed in representation one slide, is just the beginning of this lexicon. So it usually we wouldn't be able to visually think of it visually like we did with the line separating it, but that, that's only two dimensions. Yes, it's hard to, uh, at least I cannot visualize 50,000 dimensions, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, but it's the same kind of idea, right? It's, it's, a, it's a hyperplane in the sense that it's represented as a dot product of, of uh, it's, it's a vector and the decision is represented as a dot product between the vector which is the example and the vector which is your W. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. so we'll see the same thing multiple times. All right. Hopefully it will, it will uh, it's easier to digest. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, that's fine. So for, for the homework, is there anything we should do between now and Monday? So, so please go over the Eric's bonus set. Uh -huh. And I should send you mine because they've been... Uh, so so I, I'll send you one that... <coughs> One of the problems that I had that I think is uh, we can use uh, and we can kind of merge the two or invent something else or something like this. So, so I forgot to make this open. I'll do it now. Okay. Uh, and if I don't, please drop me an email this evening or something and, and I'll make sure that you can see it. So, okay. so read both of them or any other problems that you have in mind and, and let's come with kind of suggestions and figure out uh, what we want to do. Okay. Uh, I'll actually try to send you email over the weekend. Okay. I'll send you the LaTeX. Do I have the LaTeX for Eric's part? Is it there, do you know? I only have the PDF for it, not the LaTeX. There must be a folder in the website um, or in, on, on this uh, directory that is the, the, the TA directory or something like this. Okay, I will search for it. So yes, look at it. And I can also send you the latex for my problem uh, <coughs> set from previous year. Okay. So we don't have to start from scratch. Oh, yeah. okay. uh, one thing that is not completely clear to me uh, is the way they submit. I assume it's clear to you. They, they're going to submit through Canvas? Yeah, that's fine. But we can also do grade scope, I guess. Some people are using grades. So last time I remember they used grade scope. I talked to Reno, who was a TA okay. last time, and I had seen him use grade scope for okay. checking. So you may want to. Okay, so let's. So, so, so I'm to trying start. to get a meeting. Maybe the best thing would be to <coughs> for us to meet with Eric uh, early next week uh, or later this week because we need the setup. Okay, you know what? Um, I cannot meet later this week because my Friday is completely okay. But maybe you can. So do you have time tomorrow? I'm available. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, Friday. so let me let me try to send you an email and see. Maybe you can meet him. Uh, because I, my, my day tomorrow is completely <coughs> booked. And then uh, we'll see what it is. Th that's since since. I, I never taught here a class that requires so many submissions and so on. 